All right. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Takumi Maruyama of uh, Princeton University speak on the Kawanta Fever Vanishing Theorem for Schema. Go ahead, Takumi. It's all right. yours. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you all for being here. Uh, before I begin, I want to start with a land acknowledgement um, by saying I recognize I live and work on the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenny Lenape people. And I, I pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Uh, but with that, let me get started with the mathematics. So today I'm talking about the Kamada Fivig Vanishing Theorem for Schemes. Um, and just to give you an idea for what these are about, uh, the Kamada Fivig Vanishing Theorem is an important vanishing theorem by rational geometry. And I want to talk about how I recently proved it for all, all schemes of equal characteristic zero. Um, and just to give you an idea for what the talk will be like, first I'll try to motivate vanishing theorems by some questions that we would want to answer um, in algebraic geometry. Then I'll talk about some applications of my results um, to algebraic geometry and also some to commutative algebra. Um, and in the last section of the talk, I'll talk about some aspects of the proof. Um, and before I move on, let me just say that I do have the chat window open and the participants window open. So you can always ask questions via the chat and they'll try to look at them and answer them. Uh, but if not, I'll also try to pause and uh, ask if any of you have questions along the way. Um, but with that, let me get started. So uh, let me start with some motivation behind vanishing theorems. And so let me just start um, by stating a question and I'll tell you why we might be interested in answering it. So the problem that vanishing theorems answer is the following. Um, for simplicity, let's let X be a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers. Um, and let's let L be a line bundle on X. So I'm going to be using these abbreviations pretty often. Uh, so Hopefully that's okay. If you want a reminder, you can also just ask me in the chat. And the problem is when do the chief cohomology groups of X with respect to L vanish? Um, and maybe I'll just say, when does it vanish? Just to give you, an, um, just to be concrete. Okay. So why would we be interested in this question? Um, and so maybe, the most important one was an eight i equals zero, in which case we want to actually tell whether or not it's non-zero. And the reason why is because it determines maps from X to projective spaces by taking sections of L and using those to map to some projective space. Okay. And it'd be nice to be able to construct such maps by proving that H naught is non-zero, and to do that, there are a couple of tools. So let me mention one of them first. First, the riemann rock theorem and theorems like riemann rock say that the Euler characteristic of L, which is the alternating sum of the dimensions of these cohomology groups, uh, riemann rock says that this is determined by the geometry of X and L. So for example, for curves, we know that the Euler characteristic is given by the degree minus the genus plus one. And for surfaces, we know that the Euler characteristic is given by some intersection numbers one half of L times L minus K, where K is the canonical class plus one place the arithmetic genus. Okay. And to show that we have global sections, it'd be nice to know that all the higher cohomology groups vanish so we can just plug in using these formulas. Okay. Um, so that's one reason we care about vanishing theorems. Um, and the second reason is if you want to prove that you have some global sections, it's very useful to use inductive strategies and to lift information from a divisor, you need vanishing theorems. So if D instead of X is a divisor, then the long exact sequence on cohomology tells you 
that the co-kernel of the restriction map from X to D is controlled by the first sheaf cohomology group of L twisted by minus D. So this is exact. And if you knew by induction that on D you have global sections, and you know by some vanishing theorem that the first cohomology group here vanishes, Um, then these defects and the exactness imply that you have global sections on all of X. And just to emphasize this point, this is why uh, vanishing theorems are so useful in algebraic geometry and in particular by rational geometry and the minimal model problem. Are there any questions about these two uh, ways that we use vanishing theorems? Okay, um, and so this is the first time in scrolling. So what I'm going to be doing is I scroll on each side alternately so that you can see the previous slide, so to speak. So I'm now going on to the left side and you can look at the right side still if you want. Um, and to motivate uh, the vanishing theorems I'm interested in, these Kodaira type vanishing theorems, let me tell you one other way that vanishing theorems show up, which is Kodaira's projectivity criterion, which I guess is you know wanting me one of the reasons why Kodaira proved his vanishing theorem in the first place. So this was from 1954. What does this criterion says? It gives you a criterion for when a compact complex manifold is in fact a projective algebraic variety. So X is projective i.e. there's an embedding of X inside of some projective space, if and only if there exists what's called a rational Kähler class omega inside of the rational cohomology living as a subspace in real cohomology. Um, and so I won't describe what these words mean, like what is a killer class, but I do want to describe the key ingredient in this proof, which is the Kodaira vanishing theorem. So I'm only going to state the algebraic version of this. Um, I guess if you want to get the projectivity criteria, you do need an analytic version. Um, that could I approved. But the algebraic version of this vanishing theorem says that if X is a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers and L is ample, then you get vanishing of all uh, adjoint type line bundles associated to L. As long as I is greater than zero. Right. Uh, so just to be clear, this omega x is the top exterior power of the sheaf of one forms on x. Okay, that's Kodaira's vanishing theorem. Um, so then you can ask, how can we generalize this to make it, and you know, how can we use these sorts of generalizations? Um, so the first way is you might want to weaken ampleness. Um, and to me, one reason you want to do this is because if you want to, you know, do birational geometry and classify varieties up to birational equivalents or something like this, you would want some sort of condition on your line bundle that's stable under pulling back by proper birational morphisms. Um, so just to give you these definitions, let's fix a complete variety over the complex numbers. L being ample, let me just remind you what it means, means that there exists some integer such that this map 
you get from the linear system associated to the mth power of L is in fact an embedding. Um, there's two ways that I'll be generalizing this in this talk. The first way is you can say that L should be big if and only if instead of asserting they have an embedding, you have a rational map that's a birational onto its image. Okay. And the other way that you can generalize ampleness is by saying, well, if you take an ample line bundle and restrict it to a curve, the degree is always positive because you know that some power of it is like a hyperplane section inside of some projective space. And you can just say that, okay, what happens if you make the condition on the degree non-negative? Um, and hopefully you can see that ample implies big because embeddings are birational to their image and ample implies nef because as I said, you know, some power of L is a hyperplane section. Okay. And so, this leads us to the Kalman de Fieve vanishing theorem, which says that if you weaken ampleness to just big enough, you still have vanishing. So this was proved in 1982, or I guess that's when it appeared, um, and it's independently due to Kalman and Fieve. So they prove something slightly more general, but at least for this talk, let's think of this special case. X is a smooth, complete variety over the complex numbers. L is a big NF line bundle on X. Then you have the vanishing as before. So that's the first way we can generalize it. Um, and the second way that you can try to generalize it is to relativize the statement. So one reason you might want to do this is you might want to understand how cohomology changes under proper morphisms. Um, and so if you have some sort of vanishing of higher direct images, you can use the Lorray spectral sequence. But um, maybe it's just better to write down the statement. So this appeared in a paper of Kawamata, Matsuda, and Natsuki in 87. So if you have a morphism now, x to y, that's proper, surjective. And both X and Y are varieties over the complex numbers. And you also assume that X is smooth. And now instead of L being big and F, you assume that it's F big and F and F. So if you don't know why that, what this means, it's just a relative version of these um, notions. And the statement is that the higher direct images of these adjoint type line bundles vanish for all positive i. Great, are there any questions about um, these versions of Kudai vanishing? Great, uh, so what I wanna talk about today is a third way you can try to generalize it, which is to the world of schemes. So if you notice, all of these statements so far have been for varieties over the complex numbers. Um, and let me, be, before I state the theorem, let me tell you a few reasons why you might want a version of the, for example, the Kalamata Matsuda Matsuki theorem for schemes. And so what I wanna emphasize is that even if you're only interested in complex varieties, schemes show up in many places. So for example, if you look at Hironaka, Hironaka's resolution of singularities, 1964, um, Hironaka actually uses an inductive proof that requires working over schemes of finite type over quasi-excellent local rings. For example, complete local rings. Um, and more recently, progress on uh, Shakurov's ACC conjecture for log canonical thresholds 
in the smooth case and in the bounded singularity case, due to the Fernet, Ein, and Mustaza, work with schemes of finite type over formal power series rings over the complex numbers. So I guess the most general statement is Dieter Hooke and McKernan and Chu, but at least in the smooth case, they need to work over these formal power series rings, in which case the lack of vanishing theorems, um, was, um, it, it would be useful to have vanishing theorems. Uh, the last thing I'll say about why schemes are useful is that you can reduce questions about um, other spaces, for example, formal schemes, complex analytic spaces, or rigid analytic spaces, um, to the schemed case. Um, so there are many examples of this in the literature. Maybe most recently, Temkin used this to prove resolutions of singularities in those cases. Um, and also Abramovich and Temkin used these types of strategies to prove weak factorization um, in, uh, for these sorts of more general spaces. So let me state the question that I wanted to answer, which is due to Butot, Kolar, and Kawakita, although it probably was asked by other people. These are the ones I found in the literature. Is do there exist vanishing theorems? for schemes of equal characteristic zero. So I think I said these words before. Basically, I mean that they admit a morphism to spec of the, of the rational numbers. Um, and what I showed was that, yes, there are vanishing theorems along the lines of the Kamada Matsudo Matsuki theorem that hold for all proper subjective morphisms of integral Noetherian schemes over the rational numbers. So let F uh, be a morphism that's proper surjective as before of integral Noetherian schemes of equal characteristic zero. And we need a version of the smoothness assumption on X. So I'm going to say that it's regular, uh, just so it's not a relative notion. Now let's let L be a F big and F neff line bundle on X. Then the higher direct images of omega X tensor L vanish as before. Um, and just in case you're wondering what omega x means now that we don't have differential forms anymore, um, you do have to have an assumption here that provided y has a dualizing complex. Omega y bullet. And here, omega x is just the grant d exceptional pullback of omega y. If you don't know what dualizing complexes are, that's okay because eventually they'll go away in this talk. Um, great. Um, are there any questions about my main theorem? Oh, I guess you want to ask is that omega is, is just a sheaf in that case. Is that right? Uh, say that again, sorry. Omega x is just a sheaf in that case. Is that right? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Omega x is just a sheaf. Um, I guess the way that I think of it is regularity of X implies it's co-Macaulay. And so any sort of dualizing complex is going to be concentrated in one degree. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, before I move on, let me just say that, you know, if you do think about vanishing theorems a lot, you might wonder, are there versions for pairs? There are versions for pairs. Um, so in my paper, I stated for like, you know, SNC pairs when X is still regular, but if you take a resolution and you assume resolutions exist by putting some excellence assumptions in there, you can get a KLT version as well. Um, and I also prove a version of Kolar's injectivity theorem, which I won't state here, uh, but, um, you know, I guess in the vanishing theorem literature, it's considered as a generalization of these vanishing theorems. Oh. 
RA. And I do want to say that this statement is pretty much optimal. And what do I mean by this? So you might wonder, OK, uh, can you remove the sort of um, you know, the assumption on the characteristic in this statement because the comma the TV vanishing theorem, at least the relative version, still makes sense, you know, as a statement uh, without that assumption. Um, and the reason why it's optimal is because the main theorem actually fails without the over Q assumption. Um, and so in equal characteristic P, this is a result of Raynaud, and in mixed characteristic, I've been told that Totaro's examples from 2019 can be adapted to hold a mixed characteristic as well. Um, do you want to do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and before I move on to applications and the proof, let me tell you what was previously known about this problem. Um, and so the dimension two case, when X is dimension two, um, this holds by a, a strategy of Lippmann, although to get this exact statement, you would probably need to look at Kohler's book on singularities of the MMP or a paper of Tanaka on MMP for excellent surfaces. When the dimension of X is three and F is a birational morphism, this is a more recent result to the Bernasconi and Kolar. And the last thing I'll say is that there were some special cases also known when the base, the dimension of y, equals one. Um, so this is due to Buxon, Fabra, and Janssen, and Mustanza and the case independently. And so the main theorem really answers this question in all dimensions. All right. Wait, are there any questions about these special cases that were known before? All right, uh, let me point out before I move on that these also have some care P statements also. Um, and then I, now I can just move on to the next part of the talk after copying the statement of the main theorem to use later. All right, great. Um, so what are some applications of my main theorem? So maybe I'll just state two right off the bat, which is that one reason I was interested in this is I wanted to know whether the minimal model program holds for excellent Q schemes. Um, and so this is joint with Shirji Liu, but we've been working out the MMP um, and, it, and it holds. Um, the second way it's been used is also in the MMP, but now in the mixed characteristic. Um, because if you work in mixed characteristic, you still have to deal with the generic fiber somehow, which is of equal characteristic zero. So this is in the work of Bhat, Ma, Bhatak, Falvi, Shri, Tucker, Waldron, Wittishek. And there's also more recent work of Stigant and uh, Bernasconi, Brivio, and Stigant, but in any case, all of these, you know, since you have to ha deal with these generic fibers in some way, uh, you do end up using my vanishing theorem. Okay. Uh, for the rest of these applications, let me say the special case of my theorem, which I think is of particular interest, which is a generalization of Grauert Riemann Schneider vanishing. Um, and so maybe out loud, the simple way to say this is that it's for um, birational morphisms, F, 
um, and where L is equal to the structure sheet. So if you have, let's say, a resolution of singularities, and Y is a scheme as before, then the higher direct images of omega X vanish. Um, and so this special case implies the following results for excellent Q algebras that were previously known only for essentially finite type algebras over a field. Okay, and so what are the types of applications you can get? Um, so the grout riemann schneider vanishing theorem is really useful when studying, for example, rational singularities. And so the theorem that rational singularities deform due to Elke holds well, more generally for excellent Q algebras. The theorem that DLT singularities are all rational due to various people in various forms. So Elkik, um, the Kawamura Matsuda Matsuki, Bernasconi and Kolar, and now myself, all holds for excellent Q schemes. And one of my favorite applications is Boutot's theorem for in this setting. Um, so let me just state this, which says that if you have a pure map of excellent Q algebras, and R prime has rational singularities, then R has rational singularities. Um, and there are other applications as well, more in the community of algebra setting. For example, it implies uh, you know, a criterion for Colmo calling of Reese algebras or a version of the brienson skoda theorem for rational singularities. Maybe one other thing I'll state is that um, <clears throat> my main theorem yields a theory of multiplier ideals in this setting. Uh, because before there was something, we could still define multiplier ideals because the resolution of singularities exists, but somehow we still didn't know things like Skoda's theorem for them and things like that. Um, and re more recently, I used this to prove the equal characteristic zero case of the following theorem. which is that F is, if R is a regular ring and I is an ideal inside of it, then the H nth symbolic power of I is contained in I to the N for all N, where H is the largest, what's called analytic spread of the localizations of I. So I guess this is a very commutative algebraic result, but basically I want to point out that multiplier ideals were very useful. And now all the things we wanted to show using them, you can show using them because we have vanishing theorems. Um, just before I move on, um, this in equal characteristic zero and even P, this is due to Einladder, Spelled, and Smith. and Hawks or Hunicky. So in particular, if you want to use my vanishing theorems, this was already known due to Hawks or Hunicky. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is that the mixed characteristic case, when R is excellent and I is radical, is due to mon -Schweet. So this is not really the main focus of this talk. If you're interested, you can ask me after the talk about this. Great, are there any questions about these applications?
Okay. All right, great. Um, so for the rest of the talk, what I want to do is just try to describe some aspects of the proof. And before I do that, let me just paste my main theorem again. So again, what does my main theorem say? Um, say it says that um, if you have a proper trajectory morphism of integral Noetherian schemes over Q and X is regular, and L is an F big F and F line bundle on X, then these higher direct images of omega X tensor L all vanish. And again, let me just say that omega X here is the exceptional pullback of omega Y. Um, so I'm going to make two reductions. And we'll think about the special case of the rest of the talk. So by flat base change, you can assume that Y is the spectrum of a complete local ring. And you can also assume that L is F ample. Um, how do you do that? Well, now that you have a complete local base, the base is now quasi-excellent, so you can resolve singularities, and you can use cyclic covers like you do in the usual proofs of commodity big vanishing. Um, and so we're going to focus on the case when Y is a spectrum of complete local ring still containing the rational numbers, and L is an F ample line bundle instead. Um, and so to prove vanishing theorems, you want to try to use the strategies from before. And so let me point out why those strategies don't work. So what, how do usual proofs of vanishing theorems go? Um, and so the original proof to the Kodaira uses complex analysis. Um, and in particular, he used Bachner techniques. Um, and maybe now the thing to do is to use L2 methods. Um, but if you're on the scheme, right, there's no complex analysis you can do. So that strategy won't work. Another thing you can try is to use these more topological proofs that also kind of use Hodge theory. Um, but unfortunately, these proofs won't work either because there's no Euclidean topology on the scheme. Third thing you might try is these sorts of reduction modulo P proofs due to Deline, Elucy, and Raynal. Or you can try to use ultra products as uh, Shoutens and um, Arapura did. Um, but these strategies only work if you're over a field, and so reduction modulo P makes sense. Uh, and there are more recent techniques using periodic cost theory due to bottom Uri, but um, these also only work if you're over a field. And so this tells you that we really need some new ideas to get this sort of very general scheme theoretic version of commodity big vanishing. Okay. And are there any questions about those existing proofs? So what's the main idea? The main idea is, can we actually deduce the main theorem from existing cases? And how do I want to do this using limits? And the answer is yes, but there are subtleties. Right. Um, so you'll kind of see different ways that these subtleties come up. Let me tell you what I think is one of the more interesting ones, which is that we'll actually have to leave the world of schemes. Great. All right, so let me try to describe to you then how we actually use limits to get this statement. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is approximate the spaces involved, right? So we want started off with a morphism X to Y, 
and y is now a complete local ring, you can write R as a direct limit of all of its subrings of finite type over Q. And to fix notation, I'm going to let m lambda be the contraction of m to these r lambdas. Great, so that does the first part of the approximation. Uh, the second part is that, okay, now you have this morphism from x to y, can you approximate that part? And yes, you can. Um, so by pretty general statements in EGA4, you can write this morphism from x to y as an inverse limit over some subsystem of these lambdas of morphisms x lambda to a spec of r lambda. Okay. So why did I say that you have to restrict to a subsystem? Well, that's what you need to do to make sure these x lambda are integral and these f lambda are proper surjective. Um, and so let me just organize what we have so far. We had this morphism from X to spec of R. And we wrote it as an inverse limit of a bunch of morphisms X lambda to spec of R lambda. And again, what's going on in this fixture, the inverse limit of this row is gonna be the top row. All right, um, and so now we've approximated the space involved and you can ask, okay, so how do I do the rest of it? The statement is about high direct images, right? We have these R, I, F lower star of omega X tensor L, how do I approximate those? And here you run into some of the first issues in this sort of strategy. So the first thing is that these higher direct images are hard to approximate. Okay. And what do I mean by it's hard to approximate? Uh, well, the first thing you might say is, okay, so can you approximate L? Like, do there exist some sort of system of Ls on these X lambdas um, that are all going to be F ample? Well, this is okay. And this is also provided by statements in EGA4. Okay. How about these higher direct images? Can we approximate those? And the answer here is yes, due to grant Dieck's limit theorem. So this is from SGA4, stated in, some, uh, in a you know, topos theoretic fashion. Uh, but the special case for, you know, I guess, schemes in this case says that you can write down these sort of higher direct images as some sort of limit of the higher direct images on each of these X lambdas. Um, but this omega X, this causes a big issue. So I don't think we know um, how these sorts of um, dualizing complexes or dualizing sheaves behave under limits of schemes. So that tells you one issue. Uh, the other issue, I didn't really say this before, but we said that we can approximate these x's here with these x lambdas here, and you can assume that they're integral. But I didn't say that you can assume these are regular. And so we don't know that these x lambdas that you produce are still regular or smooth. And so what we'll need to do to prove the theorem is to get rid of these two issues somehow. So let's go through them one by one. How do you get rid of the first one? So to get rid of the first one, um, this is what I was alluding to when I said, if you don't know what dualizing complexes are, it's OK, because they're going to go away in the rest of the theorem or in the rest of the proof. So you can use a combination of local duality and global duality to the Lippmann 
although similar strategies also existed in work of Hartzman and Ogis, which says that if you take the higher direct images of omega x tensor L in this case, and you take what's called the matlas dual of this, what you end up getting is a certain local cohomology group on X. <clears throat> All right. So if you want to think about this more concretely, if R is just going to be the spectrum of the field, this recovers the usual statement of third duality. Right, that's where the dimension x minus one comes from, the you know, degree of the cohomology switches, and you also get, you lose omega x and gain a dual on the L. <clears throat> so to work with these, you also need to prove that these behave well under limits, and I did prove that. Great. And so we didn't lose anything by doing this translation. Uh, the second thing I want to do is to fix the smoothness of x lambda. Um, and in this case, you can just resolve them. So now we're working over a, um, over, oh, I guess, you know, these are varieties over q. And so this just follows from here, not this resolution that's here. Okay. There's one more thing um, that's a bit tricky which is that these resolutions, you need them to be compatible with transition maps. Between, you know, let's say X mu and X lambda. Um, and I don't know a way to do this um, all at once using some sort of functorial resolution of singularities. Instead, what I do is I just take all of the resolutions and stick them into an inverse system. Okay. Great. And so now we get into the place where um, we have to think about whether we need to leave the world of schemes. So I told you that the inverse limit of the two right things in this, in this diagram is going to give you the two right things in the top row. Now what happens if we take the entire bottom row and take the inverse limit? And that's the key lemma uh, that I prove. And is where you leave the world of schemes. So if you take the inverse limit, over all these lambdas and p's of the w lambda p, you end up getting what's called the zariski riemann space of x. <clears throat> what is the space? It's the inverse limit of all blow-ups of x. <clears throat> and it's not a scheme in general. In fact, I think it's only a scheme if you're dimension one. <clears throat> So this is due to Zariski and 40 and 44. Although for schemes, I guess those defined by Nagata and 63. <clears throat> I also didn't tell you what category this inverse limit is being taken in. And this is in the category of locally ring spaces. So all these sorts of limiting arguments, you need to make sure that everything works well in the cat in this larger category of locally ring spaces rather than just schemes. All right. Um, so now I'm almost done. Let me fill in this diagram first. Here we have the Zariski Riemann space, and I'm going to call this morphism pi. And let me copy this diagram again because I'll need it on the next page. Right, now we're almost ready to prove the main theorem. I do need to tell you one more thing, however. 
which is that if you think about it, what's going to end up happening is we get a statement about the Zariski Riemann space, and somehow we have to um, descend that back onto X. And so to do that, I show that the higher direct images of the structure sheaf of the Zariski Riemann space vanish for all I positive. Um, and so to prove this, you use the Grandi limit theorem as before. plus either a theorem of Hiranaka or a theorem of Chatsis, Mathieu, and Euling. About vanishing of higher direct images of structure sheaves. Although one thing I'll mention is that here you use the fact that X is regular. Or if you prefer, you can also say that X has rational singularities in the sense of Kovac. Okay, but now I've written down all the ingredients we need to prove the main theorem. Uh, maybe before I do that, are there any questions about all these ingredients? Hi, sorry, could I ask uh, something? Sure. Yeah, so just to make sure I understand. So if you knew that you can approximate this X with regular X lambdas, would you have been, it would have been over in step one, is that right? Uh, I guess, yes, I would simplify the proof. Yeah. So, you know, I think if, if X lambda is just a ring, then this is like a Neron Popescu desingularization. Um, but there's not a version for schemes. I see. They're not able to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I also, also have a small question. Yes. Your, your X lambdas, mm -hmm. do they have the same dimension as, as X? Um, so the dimension of X, let's see, there, there's an inequality um, and it actually works in your favor. Um, and so you're able to show that a lot of these, uh, these X lambdas I think are larger in dimension. And so you have more local cohomology groups vanishing than you would on X. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the way to do that is, you know, you take a chain of closed sets and you just approximate each of those closed sets and make sure that you have strict inclusion still. Um, so definitely, yes, that is an important point. Great, are there any other questions? Great, okay. Uh, so now I can just prove the main theorem for you. Um, so what does the dual version of the Kamada Matsuda Matsuki vanishing theorem say? It says, um, that if you take the bottom row of the diagram, maybe I'll copy the bottom row of the diagram here just for clarity. If you apply their theorem to the bottom row, you get that the following vanishes. So here you actually need the fullback because now we're working on. Um, W lambda P instead, <clears throat> you get that this vanishes to the theorem of Kawabata, Matsuda, and Matsuki. And here it's also useful to say that these, even though you started off with an F ample L, um, these end up being F big and F nap. So this is a, yet another place where having a birationally variant version of the Kodara vanishing theorem is useful. Okay. All right. So now you can use my version of the grand Deke limit theorem for local cohomology to say that in the, in the top row, you still have vanishing. Okay. But again, this is happening on the Zariski riemann space. Um, and so you need to descend that information uh, back onto X and to do that now, all you need to use is the Lorray spectral sequence plus the theorem I have at the top of the page, right? So since this higher direct images of the structure sheet vanish, now we know that the cohomology groups we're interested in to begin with actually vanish. 
And maybe to get the exact statement I had, you would you know, dualize this again to get a statement about higher direct images of, uh, of L, omega x tensor L. Um, but in any case, that's how you prove the main theorem. Great, are there any questions? Um, and so the last thing I want to do is kind of mention uh, places where, you know, similar ideas appear, um, although, you know, the technique of putting the Riemann, Zersky Riemann space there to prove vanishing theorems, I think is new. So the strategy of using the Grandi limit, uh, limit theorem, <clears throat> at least I learned from a paper of Panyan in 2003, to prove what's called Gerson's conjecture in algebraic K theory. In the equal characteristic case. Um, but there, um, since the question is about rings and it's about like regular rings, uh, there you can use Neron Popescu desingularization. And so somehow in that case, you, you know, the, the, the sort of approximation argument is not as complicated. Um, the other place where similar ideas appeared before is that you might wonder, okay, this is what happens in equal characteristic zero, what happens in equal characteristic P or in mixed characteristic. Um, and in that setting, this is related to um, results of Hofstra Hineke, Smith, um, Bott, both in 2012 and in 2020, and um, more recent results due to Takomatsu and Yoshikawa, and Batma, Padak, Balvi, Shri, Tucker, Walden, Wittershek, which is that you can replace the Zariski Riemann space in sort of in the uh, in mixed characteristic and equal characteristic P with what's called the absolute integral closure of X. Great. Um, but again, this is a scheme. So, you know, this idea of using this local A ring space to prove vanishing theorems, I think is something new. Uh, but in any case, well, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and, you know, you can always ask me more questions. All right. Uh, let's thank Takumi for a beautiful talk. Okay. Any questions? Um, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask is that i i don't see everyone on one oh, i suppose maybe uh could you roughly state the uh the grundy clement theorem as that turned out to be a key thing oh yeah sure um so maybe the best thing for me to do is just write it down from my notes So again, this is from SGA4, although the way that I'm stating it is from a book of Fujiwara and Kato, um, because they, they wrote down the ring, theory, uh, the ring space version without Topoi. And the statement is that if you have a compatible inverse system of a bunch of coherent sheaves on these X lambdas, So I guess you know it's compatible with pullbacks and there are morphisms that fit everywhere. The statement is that the direct limit of higher direct images induces an isomorphism with uh, direct, higher direct images of F itself. Here, these W lambdas are the projection morphisms from X to X lambda. And F here is the direct limit of the pullbacks of these F lambda. Great. So that's the statement. Is that okay?
let me think, wouldn't you say, sorry, inverse limit of the sheaves or minus six? Maybe I'm wrong, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, always confusing which way the morphisms okay, okay, go. Um, but I guess maybe it's not an inverse system, it's a direct system. You will say compatible system. But in this case, it all works out well because everything okay. just pulls back, you know, to the original CFL. So in our case, it's okay. In, what was the uh, uh, adjustment that you made to this theorem? Um, so this is a statement about higher direct images, right? Um, and the, what I had to do was to make it work for these local cohomology groups instead. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you are familiar with these sorts of things, like, you know, what you need to do is just to reduce the local cohomology statement to something about higher direct images uh, by taking some complements in correct places. Uh, and, you know, I tried to be as general as I could, so you need some quasi-compact assumptions in some cases. But in any case, in our case, it all works out well. Great, thanks. Any other question, anyone? Okay, I don't see any hands up. So let's thank uh, Takumi again.